<laughs> Does that not freak you out? Have you ever done that before? That you can click a button and accidentally cost yourself like $500? Not even $500. Dude, I read an article on this that was like, I accidentally charged myself 14 grand. <sighs> and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> like this is terrifying. Oh my God. But um, the response from like the Google SME or whatever was like, dude, I'm so sorry this happened to you. You know, it was very emotionally mature response too. He was like, you know, I can't imagine what it might, must be like to, to, you know, see that number or whatever. But for you to do this, you had to be pretty dumb. everyone. We've all heard of Project Discovery, right? The authors of Nuclei, HTPX, and countless other essential security tools. What you may not have heard of, however, is their conference, Hardly Strictly Security Conference. This conference is happening April 25th from 8 a.m. onward virtually, and it's featuring the topic of everything open source security tooling. They'll have speakers from top companies like Vercel, Datadog, Hashcorp, and Fastly, and it's oriented towards anybody who cares about open source security tooling, whether you're a bug hunter, a red teamer, security leader, whoever. Uh, there should be great content for you at this conference. So if you're interested, head over to nux.gg slash hss24 slash hss24, right? Uh, hardly Strictly Security, and then 2024 uh, to sign up and register and get in on that conference goodness. All right, with that, back to the show. Dude, I'm so freaking cold right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't... Man, you got to turn your heat up. Uh, no, it, it's not that, man. It's the cold showers. Do you do the cold showers? No, I don't do. I don't do that. Dude, I I know a bunch of you do that, and I think you're crazy for it. <laughs> Dude, like I don't normally do it very often, but like I was, I've like I stopped lifting for a couple weeks, and then I'm getting back into it, and I've been pretty sore. So I was like, all right, you know, what, let me see if I can do like a cold shower, and now I'm just like like core cold you know like it, <laughs> i'm not cold like i i've got like plenty of clothes on and like got even the heater is on the feet right now but like something deep in my core is just freezing it's freezing yeah. interesting where, where are That's you at man you're in a hotel today yeah yeah i'm up in uh, i'm in upstate new york i'm in buffalo for the eclipse oh really oh you went up there to see the eclipse huh yeah 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 i've got some friends up here so i thought it would be a fun little trip and uh yeah, I, yeah, it's it's exciting. I saw this. It's a little cloudy right now, but I'm hoping that it clears up. Hopefully so. That that would suck if you went there for that. It was just <laughs> straight clouds for the whole <laughs> eclipse. I know. I, I saw know. this crazy graph of like Airbnb bookings right on that little band, and it's like everything is booked in that entire band. It's so interesting. Yeah, um, I mean the hotels were like ridiculously expensive. Really? Because um, I've sp I've stayed here bef in, in this area before, and it's like usually very you know normal hotel prices and then it was like two or three times minimum uh as much per night um just Ouch, to like dude that that sucks man <laughs> that is not a normal normal thing to pay rip yeah it's it's a it's a little bit ridiculous but i was able to find you know a, a pretty good deal so all things considered you got like the goggles I think it's or whatever it, yeah. the glasses that you need i do for have it? the special glasses you know i've got um you know these nice special special glasses Thanks. so you can look at the sun and stuff and cool. they're basically like w paper welding goggles you know <laughs> I, I have a vested interest in you being able to see so uh please <laughs> me too please me protect too. your eyes um, i would yeah i'm not gonna stare directly at the sun don't stare directly at the sun <laughs> great well what if you stare directly at the moon it, well, okay well uh, <laughs> Gotcha on that I one. Am, Didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. Yeah, okay. Don't stare. Well, maybe you can stare directly at the moon. I don't know. All right. All right. Well, we'll leave that up to the experts in, you know, astrology and we'll get back to our our lane, yeah, exactly. which is bug bounty. Where do we want to start out today, Joel? We got a we got a decent amount of things on the list today. Yeah, so there was this there was this really cool um event that I saw. Um Yes We Hack uh is running dude ran, i saw that it's over now i think they ran a live hacking event um with louis vuitton which is super cool um where was this event you know i, I imagine it was I, I believe it was paris um yes okay. it was in paris and i saw you know i talked to a couple people that went to the event and saw the pictures online and it looks 
pretty freaking well done you know yeah it's pretty exciting i, I don't know if yes we hack has run an event before have they run live hacking events i think or is they this have one? done a couple but i think this is the one that like for me this is the one that put them on the map with regards to like live hacking events because it's like there have been some small ones here or there but louis vuitton is a pretty cool target and yeah. you know it's in paris and the the pictures are really good the swag looked really good it looked like an awesome time yeah, I mean, it looks really, really sick. So I'm hoping to see more um, more events from the team. But it's cool to see such a large, like, non-traditional brand doing an event like that. You know, I'm, I'm sure uh, that other fashion brands and stuff are going to see that and maybe hopefully get interested in doing security events, which would be super cool. I know there's so many um, luxury brand Dude, lovers <laughs> in the, swag, the Bug Bounty ha- the hacker The swag for that, br- for that, like, event just... Ah, oh, imagine having like a custom Louis Vuitton like freaking so jacket that they've got there. I don't, I don't even know. So I haven't even gotten confirmation. I imagine that this is the case, but I haven't gotten confirmation that those are actually Louis Vuitton jackets. Yeah, like, I don't know. But I don't know. The concept is still pretty cool. I think if it if it was actually a Louis Vuitton jacket, I would absolutely fly out just for that. You know? For sure, for sure. Like, yeah, I mean, super cool, right? That, like once, one, like one time, super epic swag. Like that is that's super cool. It's such an enticing, uh, what you, enticing. Yeah, so dude, opportunity. I, I'm not normally the one to do stuff like that too. I I normally look at this like pretty from like a business perspective. Like, okay, you know, I'm gonna have to spend whatever, however much on flying Mariah out and like, you know, going to go out to the event, that sort of thing is, you know, the opportunity cost of hacking on other programs when the bounties aren't quite as high, that sort of thing. But like, I feel like there's a special niche of swag that's like pretty different, which is something that holds mainstream sway, like Louis Vuitton. Right. But I feel like, like if it was like, all right, we'll give you like a, I feel like I might do it for like a custom laptop or like, you know, something like that. But also Louis Vuitton jacket, that would be, that'd be really rad. So I, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I didn't really put myself in the category of, of hackers that would go to a live hacking event just for the swag, not, not considering the bounties and that sort of thing. Like, like I probably wouldn't spend a bunch of time on the program if the bounties weren't great, but I would definitely go and hack for at least a couple of days for that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Absolutely, you know. Hey, if Louis Vuitton wants to send a uh, send us invites next time, yeah. Maybe. Well, <laughs> I'll dude, for sure I say need, yes. I need to go make a Yes We Hack account because I don't even have a Yes We Hack account. Mm. So yeah, that's true. I don't think I have one either. That's probably not really helping my chances. Yeah, yeah. I think we gotta, you know, do something here <laughs> to get to get on the board. But um, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I was looking at the results. I I dropped that tweet in the in the doc, Joel. But the results um for that live hacking event are up, and man, dude, teams. Spain, they are just crushing it with crushing it. almost all of the um, all of the awards at this event went to Team Spain. Yeah, it looks like they they work together, the yeah. three of them, because they all have the same number of reports. Uh, but yeah, they they really crush it. And our boy Nagley, of course, you know, yep. right right, f- not not far behind them. It's interesting that they won first, second, third, because um, like their points are different, even though they oh, yeah. all have oh check that out yeah just by a couple number of reports and stuff i'm not really sure maybe it's just like the severity or i'm not really sure how the reporting structure works over there but um i would have expected that they would have been like tied for first so i think technically nagley actually got second uh exactly if if you're ignoring the points but yeah 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 i i I don't know what do you think about this what do you think about like a points-based leaderboard because i think that was something that hacker one did away with really quickly early on in the live hacking event game as they were you know kind of figuring that whole thing out and i think pretty much every other you know bug bounty platform makes that in my opinion mistake of doing it based off of points in the beginning um rather than doing it based off of money uh but then we've seen other the other we've seen bug crowd and integrity both come around on that and sort it by money now um so i'm I'm kind of curious as to why yes we hack isn't doing that yeah i don't know um i'm not sure why they did it but it's, I mean, it's an interesting approach. I think HackerOne didn't like the gamification aspect of it, mm-hmm. where um, a lot of people were just like finding ways to gamify that to get on like the top of the leaderboard, where you know, money, like bounty amount, is usually a direct correlation with impact. Mm-hmm. So higher bounties, higher impact. 
you know, it's like a pretty good way of sort of like measuring and like having like a scoring mechanism. Uh, but even on the hacker one leaderboard, you see that there's other ways of sorting it too. Yeah. Like they have sorting by like number of reports and number of resolved and like that kind of stuff too. So it's not all exclusively just money, but I think that money is a pretty good way of measuring it. Um, maybe the points are their, their same, uh, sort of thing yeah yeah maybe so i it definitely depends uh you know i i mostly just pay attention to the bounty amount ones but then there's also that aspect of like okay well when you've got a tallying bounty amount you know total and you have sorting by bounties and you know they're, they're those people that are like nagly that write the scripts and are be like all right justin just got a you know 15k bounty all right note that down <laughs> in my little notebook <laughs> like <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like i don't know why you know he does this but he is like freaking bounty uh uh you know intelligence agency because you can be like all right nagly how much did you know justin make at the paypal event in 2023 and he'll give you like the number within a 10 percent plus or minus somehow every time i was like how do you it's know pretty that crazy like he he really is like tracking it somewhere somehow because it's um he definitely like has a lot of data on that stuff like i remember one time we were in our discord and we were mm. chatting we were like he was like oh i know how much everybody's made you know like with their total bounty amounts i was like what's mine and he was like 10k off i was like wow <laughs> oh wow okay Jeez, not really man he's he's definitely got some some data and you know that's that's one of his things you know is, is data so uh it's on brand but creepy nonetheless yeah. i must say <laughs> yeah a little bit a little bit the nagly intelligence network yeah. you know but yeah i, I did um uh, so shout out to team spain they did awesome shout out to piku haka uh or haka piku depending on where you are in the uh you know if you're on discord or on um on twitter uh they got best dressed bug biggest impact that's pretty awesome um and yeah looked like an awesome event for sure um very very cool yeah. Yeah. What's so? What is this? What is this little this little note underneath? Oh, you okay. Have some insider. Yeah. You have some insider so information. I do have some insider information. So I, I will. You know, normally if it's Nogly, I'll throw Nogly under the bus. This one was not Nogly, but I did talk to a couple of other people um, from that event. And one con that I can say about that event is um, the top earners were not actually earning very much. The bounties were not awesome for that event. Um, hmm. So I can say roughly. It, assuming the the data is accurate, and I probably should double check with Nogli because he's got good data on all this stuff too, <laughs> but it seems like quite a bit off. Like it could be somewhere between one fifth to one tenth of what a, a top earner at a any given live hacking event is making or any given hacker one live hacking event is making. So Interesting. that's a little bit- Do you bit, know why that was? Was it bounty table? Bounty or? table. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's got to be a combination of bounty table and scope, but I know that there were some exclusive crits um, that were, that were paid out, you know, one person crits or whatever. But I, I believe the, the, the bounty table for that event was not very high. And that's why, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit discrepancy between hacker ones, live hacking events and, and something like this. Mm-hmm. Super interesting. Yeah. So well, that, but but I mean, they're making like we said, they're making up for it with the with the crazy you know target and the crazy swag. Because like, how sick would it be to be like, I just was spent the weekend hacking Louis Vuitton. Like, it was pretty rad. I know, right? It's super cool. It's super cool. I I love. I mean, there, that's always like one of the really cool aspects of the, the LHEs is like the name aspect and like mm. getting to hack these big companies and stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Dude, let's uh, let's jump over to the browser market share stuff because this is a really interesting topic that we were having a discussion around in the Discord recently. And so I went and like double clicked on it a little bit and figured out some details. And I highlighted the the interesting ones there in the doc, Joel. But so I feel like a lot of people throw around this this number of like um, Safari having a decent amount of market share um, in the browser space because if you look it up, yeah. it says like. 18 yeah, it's like the second most used browser, right? Yeah, second most used browser, 18.5%. Um, and they still have not adopted same site lax default. So uh, that this really affects, you know, C serves. Um, but if you look into it a little bit more and you look at the breakdown for this, you know, there's there's desktop users and there's mobile users. And maybe I'm just mm -hmm. thinking about this wrong, but um, desktop users only have 
uh, Safari only has eight percent of desktop users, and they all, that makes sense. And they have twenty four percent of mobile users, right? Which which makes sense because iOS is kind of a bigger platform on mobile for sure. Um, yep. But I feel like a lot of the apps that we hack are like not something that you casually log into on your phone. You, maybe I'm off with that because I, I know that the, the statistics are pretty high on like 70% of web traffic is like mobile or something like that. But I feel like they're, you know, when we're reporting stuff to like this business analytics platform or something like that, I feel like people aren't going to be logging in on their phone and being like, all right, let me run this report and you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I feel like knowing what kind of target demographic your website that you're hacking has, and then being able to give them browser specific exploits and numbers on that could be a helpful thing. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good call out. I mean, I think it is good to sort of break it down into the, like the desktop and the mobile stuff because I, that the total stats is, it always catches people off guard Mm -hmm. when you tell them, Oh, you know, like, uh, why don't you tell me, like, in order, what are the top three browsers? And most people yeah. are going to say, oh, like, Chrome, Firefox, mm-hmm. um, you know, Safari or Edge. And mm-hmm. you're like, nope, Chrome, mm-hmm. Safari, Edge. Mm-hmm. And you're like, what? And, you know, yeah, I mean, Safari as a whole almost has 20% of the market. But the reality is that it's mostly mobile people um, using iPhones because there's so many iPhones mm-hmm. and they don't use an alternative browser. They just use Safari. Um, that they have that large share, whereas Android, you know, the default browser is Chrome, and the browser that most people use on, on Android is Chrome, which is why they have such a high um, mobile share. Plus, I mean, I use iOS, but I use Chrome on my phone. Oh, really? Um, as my browser. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people do. Um, so it, it is really interesting, and I think that's a good like that's a good idea. Like, you should always kind of be framing your write ups and your POCs and your bugs and stuff to try and show the most impact for whatever company you're hacking mm. on. So I think also targeting sort of like you know more people are like if this is a mobile specific website then more people are going to be likely to be using safari yeah. than they would on desktop and if there's a safari specific vulnerability like that you can take advantage of same site lacks uh no, no default same site mm. um you know setting then yeah. yeah yeah no i think that makes a lot of sense and 25 percent, you know that's a pretty decent chunk of mobile traffic so if you are focusing on a site like you said that has mobile presence then that's very significant, um, and not yeah. something that I was I was super uh, w- well acquainted with uh, before. Um, but one thing that I, I wanted to shout out as well from looking at the statistics was like Firefox. If you look at the total market share, has only a two point eight percent, yeah, you know, presence, and and they're they're it's point five percent in mobile, right? So nobody is yeah. using Firefox on. Mobile. I don't know anybody who uses Firefox mobile browser, and. Yeah. I will say, like, I think a lot of more people used Firefox back in the day. Um, it was a lot more popular of a browser, but then Chrome, like, rocketed past it yeah. after a while, after after it sort of, like, gained popularity and gained a lot of features and stuff. And then Firefox surged a little bit when they did the, the Quantum or whatever, like, the, the they what? rewrote their... Firefox, like, rewrote their engine to be super fast and then really? optimized. Um and that like gave it a performance edge on Chrome, and I think that surged their popularity. But now there's like so many browsers, like you see Opera, right? Like yeah. Opera is now like a, I would say like a marketing heavy browser where they're like on social media a lot. They sponsor lots of like YouTube channels and stuff. Two point five percent. Almost, yeah, they have almost the same market share I, as Firefox. I would have I would have never thought that. That was that was why this is crazy to me. It was like. Opera has the same presence and more presence on mobile <laughs> than Firefox mm-hmm. does. But um, Firefox still has 6% of desktop users, which I thought was a little bit higher than expected. Um, so there is, there is, you know, it's still a little bit hard to sell that because, um, you know, Firefox isn't doing same set lacks either, despite if you Google it, it says they are, but they rolled it back. Apparently I found out recently. Um, uh, and it's, so 6% of users, like, I feel like that might be a little bit of a tricky sell if you're trying to talk about it in a report. But if you can bu- combine it with 8% from Safari and the 25% on mobile, like, there's a decent amount of users that potentially could get affected by a um, same site. Or <laughs> Let me see if I can say this properly. A cross-site attack, right? Um, a C-surf attack uh, without 
you know, these, these same site lacks default protections in place. So uh, I don't know. It's just helpful to have the numbers and be aware of these sort of things. You know, 15% on, on desktop, 24% on mobile. Not insignificant numbers, um, but I think this is also a really good statistic for the people on the program side as well. Because as much as I hate to put, you know, so severity lowering weapons in your hands, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. You know, like the reality is that when programs come back with these, you know, if anybody reports something that's like, oh, this only works on Edge or this only works on Firefox, then you know, you, you can't really be surprised when they're going to put a damper on the severity yeah. or they're going to lower your bounty or whatever, because if you look at the raw numbers, if it's not on, affecting Chrome, like, well, we'll start there. If it's not affecting Chrome, then it's already like in the minority missing almost, almost half of the market. And then if it's not More affecting, yeah. Yeah. Right. And then if it's not affecting, uh, you know, Safari or edge, then that's, the other like third <laughs> but, yeah i mean you're you're basically at you know 10 percent or less of the market so it's a very very difficult uh case to make but you can still report it nonetheless i, I think programs will still fix it it's just going to be way lower impact yeah yeah i think so too all right dude i'm going to tell you a story from this week of uh of bug bounty hunting because i was um Let's see, how vague do I want to make this? I want to make this pretty vague, I think. I, okay. I was signing up for a service that I will use, you know, that I am using on a regular basis um, that has a bug bounty program that I'm aware of. And that, okay. um, let's say within the past year and a half, there has been a, a live hacking event on this target. And okay. they got a lot of reports and a lot of eyes. It was a pretty big one, you know. Um, and I found a bug, uh, while I was signing up for this service that was just like right in front of me, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so one, it, it, and, and I looked back at my logs and I looked at this <laughs> endpoint before and I missed it. Uh, I missed this exploit and what it was is this, it was a part of the OAuth flow and it was just a classic example of, um, being able to use the at sign to bypass uh, host restrictions um, huh. on the redirect URI. And it, they weren't allowing slash uh, you know, in that username password section on the, on the left side of the at. They weren't allowing um, uh, backslash. They weren't allowing hashtag. They weren't allowing a bunch of stuff. But they made the mistake of allowing a question mark in there which makes okay. it a part of the query um, that, you know, and they were still parsing it as if that part that was following the at sign was the domain rather than the part before. Um, so that allowed me to just completely hijack the account. And uh, it, would, it had to be sent to the root of my domain, which is a little tricky, but uh, you know, and I had to go in there and like edit my index.php page or whatever. Um, That's super interesting. But yeah, being, being, making sure you know, being thorough with these sort of things when you're testing these, you know, trying the at sign, trying the 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 question mark, the hashtag, the forward slash, the backslash, all of the terminating characters, really important because sometimes you get that one that just works. So this was in a username and it would allow you to like do like basically like do, do like a forgot password, but it would no, no, send no, no, it no, to no, the no, wrong no. place. So, to, to, totally different. Sorry. So it was an OAuth flow, right? With the redirect yeah. URI. So, you know, yeah. where it sends the code to you afterwards. And it's using yeah. the username and password part, you know, for basic auth of the URL. So you can do like, uh -oh. you know, you can do like HTTPS uh, colon slash slash test at google.com and it'll yeah. still send it to google.com. But if you do test yeah. question mark at google.com, that it'll send it to test, yeah. right? And so yep. that was how I sort of broke that auth flow. And they they still said, okay, this host is, you know, whatever host it was. But actually, my my domain was before the at sign terminated by a question mark there. And so the actual browser navigated to my domain with the valuable code that can be uh, used as the session token. Gotcha. That's super cool. That's a cool bug, man. Yeah. You'll have to tell me who uh, who, who was on after. I'll, after I'll tell you started. afterwards. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of annoying that I missed it before, but I was I was like, oh, someone must have found this and they just must have like... Do you think it was there the whole time? Oh, yeah. It was there for sure. I have validation okay. that it was there. Um, oh, wow. But uh, yeah, it just somebody... We, we all missed it. And, it. and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. Um, wow. So... Yeah, kind of a crazy, crazy one from this week. Cool. Um, I saw that you you made a tweet 
about um, Kaido workflows. Yeah, dude. Finally. Okay, so check this out. Kaido is um, dropping global workflows this week, uh, probably by the time this airs, but if not, short, shortly after. Um, and what this means is that you will be able to build workflows and then reuse them across different projects, which is something that I feel like should have been there from the very beginning, uh, but it is something that the community has been asking for for a little while. And it's really helpful because you can build out these automations that make your work, your hacking workflows, yeah, work, I mean, that's why they're called workflows, much, <laughs> um, much more efficient. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to that release. Plus, they're easy to share now, too, um, thanks to even better um, from Bebex. And I, I wanted to shout out as well that I, in conjunction with the announcement that this is going to be in the next um, you know, release, uh, we saw a bunch of pull requests go into uh, the Kaido slash workflows repo on GitHub for a bunch of really awesome um, things like generating a CSERF POC at like doing f something that should have been in birth since forever, which is um, JSON to form form data and form data back to JSON uh, yeah. encoding for for the request body, um, and these are all done by by Ryota. Um, cool. And so, definitely very high high quality code, and it's good to see another another you know top hacker investing into the Kaido environment. Yeah, this is really awesome. It's cool to see. Um, it's cool to see that there's like a community, sort of like you know, way to contribute these and share these with other people and create a really awesome base of mm. different workflows, mm. um, and like show what's possible, etc. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, this is really really cool. But previously, you could export them and stuff like that, and then reimport them into different projects, but it was kind of a pain. So having these be yeah. global, I think, will be be really helpful. Um, Super awesome. So, yeah, and we've been seeing a lot of it, more investment into the Kaido environment lately, which is cool. Um, definitely excited about that, and excited about building some stuff out. I've got a I've got a topic next week for the pod that I'm going to talk about some ideas for a Kaido plugin that I want to develop. Slash, maybe someone in the community will develop. Who knows? Mm. Um, uh, that I'm going to talk about. So we'll we'll save that one for next cool. week, though. Um, That's awesome, dude. So. I was going back through my uh, bookmark tweets uh, in prep for this episode, and I saw this tweet from uh, November 2023, uh, and it was when we were talking about like <clears throat> doing like OAuth app redirects, uh, OAuth redirects to app schemes, and yep. this this dude comments on it and and he says. Uh, at TechnoGeek here, instead of a malicious app installed, uh, a user could directly steal the token if their server uh, to their server if the scheme controlled is allowed. Okay, so it's a little bit, a little bit. I, I haven't read it out loud yet, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> essentially, what he's saying here is that it, if you can control any scheme um, for an app, then you could just trigger Google Chrome, and then Google Chrome has this uh, Google Chrome colon slash slash navigate question mark URL equals that will navigate yeah. Google Chrome to that specific URL. Um, and <clears throat> so I don't know. What do you think about this? Do you think this is something useful to use in a chain from a mobile perspective or? Yeah. So like I said, um, I think Chrome is the default browser on Android now. So this does yeah. kind of assume that Chrome is installed, um, but it probably is. I think in most cases, that's not to say, you know, People haven't downloaded Firefox or some other Opera or whatever on their phone. But I think probably in most cases, I, I'd really like to see the breakdown actually by OS for um, mobile for what the browsers um, are. Because I'd imagine like Android is probably very, very high percent oh, yeah. using Chrome. That being said, um, there are definitely some good cases to use this. So if you were to just open HTTP or HTTPS, by default, the system is going to use your browser or it's going to prompt you to use any app that can open browser links. Yeah. So it does almost the same thing. But I think if there's some sort of check, for example, like say um, say the app is checking where where a link, you know, if any link that gets opened, what's the, what's the scheme on it? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's checking for HTTP and HTTPS and doing some extra logic there, you could bypass that with Google Chrome. Mm. Um, you know, if you instead just link out directly to the Google Chrome app and then have that open the URL for you, uh. you don't have to worry about the app logic trying to, you know, prevent you from going to a certain URL or parsing the host or something like that if it's looking at the HTTP schemes. 
Um, but yeah, I think this is a this is a really creative way of you know sort of in implicit. It's not really open reader. It's it's like an implicit open reader. It's, it's a gadget. Kind of you know what you I mean? Know, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, a gadget. gadget. It's a good gadget for mobile stuff for sure. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't really. Of course, you know, you you could just use the HTTP HTTPS scheme. That that makes sense too. If any scheme is being permitted, um, but yeah, like you said, if there's restrictions around those, then that that could be interesting. I, I wish there was some way in mobile for you to do something like what we just talked about for the other OAuth thing, where it's like you know I could do whatever at Google Chrome colon slash slash navigate question mark mm. URL equals blah blah blah. You know that would be really cool if there was some way to like essentially trash some text uh <laughs> so there are some ways um one of the ways but not prefix text right not pre yeah so basically it would have to start with the same scheme like it would have to be like google chrome colon slash slash and then the parsing problem yeah um but there are some ways to do it i believe baggy pros golden url tricks um mm -hmm. we talk about this all the time <laughs> yeah we talk about this one all the time but i'm fairly certain there's some tricks in there that still work um for this type of you know host like parsing problems with like backslashes and ads and stuff mm, mm. yeah that we'll, we'll have to I'll have to double double check that i feel like i can't read this um you know write up by yeah, we'll, we'll Pro <laughs> enough times like every time i come back to this it's like the gift that keeps on giving or something like that um but yeah, I think that could also be another really interesting area of research is like, let's look into the Android scheme parsing. Uh, I mean, we have the source code, so we could just look at source code um, and see how that works specifically. If there's any way for us to, in, you know, put some text in there, get it parsed as a different part of the scheme or something like that, that would allow us to do something with a starts with. Because I feel like a lot of these redirects for mobile are like, okay, starts with Google Chrome. You know, if that was what it was redirecting to or starts with, you know, snap or whatever. Um, and then if it does, then they're like, all right, whatever. Um, so if you could find a way to redirect to a different scheme, uh, like the Google Chrome scheme, then you could exfiltrate out pretty much anything you want um, via those OAuth flows, which would break a ton of websites. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I saw this really cool thing on Twitter mm. while we're talking about Twitter. Mm. I think a lot of this stuff today is uh, from Twitter. Yeah. But um, you mentioned that there was this guy who's been doing a really awesome self-documentation, self-blog type of thing uh, yeah. um, of your bug bounty method. All. I, this is the methodology that you tweeted a long so, time ago, right? Yeah, sort of. So uh, I, I won't take full credit for this <laughs> um, as far as like, oh, you know, this guy. And I'm I'm sorry, dude, I, I'm going to butcher your name, but it's Shreyas. Sh Shreyas? Sh Sh yeah. Shreyas Shavan. Um, and essentially what they did is they, they did one of these really cool detailed write-ups that we talk about from time to time on the pod. Um, but essentially he's saying the, the roadmap I, f I followed to make 15K in bounties in my first eight months, starting from zero. And if you look at the, the Notion site that he links out to, very detailed, you know, he's got exactly how many hours he spent each month, how many days he worked, how much bounty he's got, how many reports he submitted, number of programs, etc. Um, and uh, just very, very detailed stuff. And, you know, I won't say that this is like the best pathway that someone could have taken you know in my opinion if you read through his actual roadmap i think there's a lot of things in there there's a couple things in there that that um i wouldn't necessarily agree with but one of the things that he does uh mention and he doesn't give me credit for this specifically so i'm not trying to steal credit for this just just to be clear um although he does shout us out at the in one of the tweets at the bottom of the uh, of the write up um is this whole concept of making sure you're doing enough hacking while you're mm -hmm. learning. So he, he, yeah. he, he talks about this concept of 60% hunting, 40% learning, 80% you know, hunting, 20% learning, you know, making that shift as you're continuing yeah. to grow. And this is something that I'm telling people in the CTVB Discord all the time that are, that are new, that message me and are like, hey, what do I do? You hack. You, you get out there yeah. and you fail and you fail and you fail and you fail and you look at that as a part of your training because it is. And eventually 
you can only bang your head into a wall for so long and uh, before the wall breaks down. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, being failure versus yeah. like good, but you also have to learn when it's productive, right? Yeah. Uh, like to, to fail. And so, you know, getting that hands on experience is really important. Um, what do you, what do you mean like by that? What do you mean so. by, by being failure versus is good? Well, I think like there are lots of areas in life where being failure versus is even life or death right Mm, like mm. it for example like driving a car right like if you take the wrong turn or you turn at the wrong time like that could be potentially fatal um but that's not but like in bug bounty if you take the wrong turn it's not fatal Mm. right like that's a learning experience um and that's something that can be useful but it can also be a really big time sink so training yourself to be able to identify those situations and spend time failing so that you can better identify when something is not necessarily a failure or when you can trust your gut or not trust your gut. Like we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a lot of aspects of bug bounty where failing can be good or can lead you to find other things that, you know, maybe gadgets or things that are just like, you know, useful to know. Um, But it's important to push yourself to go into those areas, even if it might not feel comfortable, even if you think that you are going to fail, just because there might be more there than you realize. Yeah, I I thought I disagreed with you on that, but I I think I do agree. You know, there's there's there are areas where it's do or do, you know, Um, but I think bug bounty is an area where and I think most most skills that you're trying to learn rather than actions you're trying to perform, like driving a car or something like that. should be failure should be looked at as almost a celebration of having done the thing in the first place, yeah. you know, um, and and as a part of the process, if one hundred percent. And so I think that if, for people like me who are essentially success obsessed, I, I am very driven by <laughs> success and uh, the, yeah. the the feeling of achievement. Um, right. I think it's really hard to reframe that, but if you can, then it'll help you push through those beginner stages, which I think is what deters almost everyone. Uh, yeah. Because the, those beginner stages can be really difficult when you're failing and failing and failing and failing. Yeah, for sure. And I'm the same way. You know, I I, I don't think anybody really likes to fail. Yeah. Um, but you can learn to, you know, sort of fail elegantly mm. or, you know, to take it not as a failure, but as a learning process. Mm. Yeah, for sure. A couple, a couple more things I wanted to to shout out on on this write up. One, I just appreciate the commitment to it. You know how much detail went into recording all this stuff and then putting it on a public you know page where people can benefit from seeing your consistency and um, yeah. to achieve your goals. And I also want to highlight that um, around nine months in, he started in July. He um, uh, did this in wrote this up in March. Um, he's starting to actually see some good traction. Last month, he made fourteen grand. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, fourteen grand from from Bug Bounty, um, and this is very. It, it's not consistent with that write up that I that I did um, on my that's pinned to my Twitter profile, um, in, in that he should have been seeing sort of increasing amounts of bounties as he continues to go um, over the past couple months, but um, he is seeing his first five figure month about right. nine months in, you know, eight, eight to nine months yeah. in, which I think is about accurate. I think you could get to the point where you're making, uh, you know, five figures a month in bug bounty after really, really working your ass off for, for nine months. Yeah. Which is a really good reality check too. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't really, they think like, okay, like I'm going to, you know, read some stuff for a month and then mm-hmm. I get bounties next month. Right. It's like, no, nah, <laughs> not really. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely going to be, you know, small bounties and failures along the way. Um, but seeing these sort of write-ups are with transparent details, really, really encouraging, especially when it's been such a long process for this. I mean, this is 600 hours put into this thing. So, um, definitely applaud this person's commitment and, uh, yeah, man, if I could long a person, you know, if I could invest into a person, uh, I would be willing to bet that this person's going to make a chunk in Bug Bounty in the future. Nice. Um, that's awesome. And, 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 that's, that's that's high praise from, from, from you. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, man, I, I can see the writing on the wall for sure. Um, and th- another another piece of that was that he said, hey, I'd re- you know, step nine of his process, I'd recommend 
reading at least a thousand of the Hacker One reports. You know, I don't even know how many Hacker wow. One reports are there. You know, I, I don't even know. But he he said that he went through and read a bunch of them, um, and I think that takes a lot of commitment to go through and read a lot of those. Um, I will say, disclosed Hacker One reports are like free blog posts. Yeah, you know, it's it's a really good resource for just understanding how other hackers think and what stuff leads to um, vulnerabilities and like why it's impactful. And especially when there's like good, good communication between the program and the researcher and stuff. Like it's really, it's nice to see those kinds of examples that you can think about in your own communications and on your own reports. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and sort of in line with that, I, I kind of also want to recommend one other blog, uh, monkey hacks. Um, this is by Kieran, um, and he's every I, I read these every single week he's, or every single time he sends them out uh, uh, sort of an update on his uh, his hundred hour bounty challenge. He's at thirteen and a half k, um, and he's got sixty three hours left, so he's only you know thirty seven hours in. So he's doing pretty well. Um, but this is another person that's kind of doing a, uh, an update on a pretty regular basis. We mentioned Alex Chapman doing an update on a pretty regular basis of their bounty progress. So I really like this trend. I think it's I think it's encouraging for the community. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, all right, let's see what else we got on the on the um, on the list for today. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to the last one real quick, and then we'll come back. Um, sure. So, once again, going through the bookmarks on uh, on Twitter, super valuable. Uh, and I noticed this. Uh, yeah, I checked mine today, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's helpful, yeah. man. It, you know, it, it's hard to go back through and and like look at those on a fairly regular basis. Uh, it just because you forget, but when you, for me, you know, when I'm in an environment where I'm like, oh, let me try to, you know, deliver the most high quality bug bounty content I can, I, that's a place for me to get data. Um, so it's nice. I really like that about prepping for these podcasts that I get to go back and sort of review that stuff. Um, yeah, for sure. And one of the nuggets that I found was a post from Port Swigger Research just, just probably about a month ago. Yeah, a month ago. Um, announcing that they had a, a high quality contribution to their XSS te- uh, cheat sheet by someone named Hans Machine or Hans Machine. Um, and it, this is the use of the on-form data um, sort of event handler. And the, the payload is, f- is form tag, on form data equals alert one. And then inside the form tag, there's a button. And if you click it, it triggers on form data. Um, not, not something really super revolutionary, but cool nonetheless, might definitely get you past some, some laughs. Um, but more so, Joel, I, I kind of wanted to talk about the process for this because it's like, how do new event handlers get added you know, into, into Chromium or like, why are we just figuring out about this now? Um, so I, I went down this tangent of like, let me see how this happens. And here, well, for, Joel, do you know where it happens? Just to, just to test your. Well, I knowledge. do now, but I, I didn't. I didn't before. Okay. Well, one of the yeah. <laughs> Thank you for actually reading my document. Then, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, essentially, what I discovered was one of the best places to see where this is happening is the Blink, uh, Blink Dev Google Group, and Blink- which Blink is the like the code word for Chrome, right? Is that? Am I correct? You know, I think it is the code word for Chrome's HTML, maybe not just HTML, it just its renderer. Um, okay. Which is, uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Blink is the rendering engine used by Chromium. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's Chromium's rendering engine. And they do this awesome thing in this Google group where they will uh, put like a, a post up and, you know, get comments from the community on... Um, on any feature that they intend to ship. So they'll prefix the, the subject of the message to the Google group with intent to ship, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, cool, perfect. You know, <laughs> like, like <laughs> that is exactly what I want to see. Um, so for the, for the critical thinkers in the, um, in the CTBB discord, I went ahead and added a, uh, a, a channel, exclusive channel that will um, give us an alert anytime there's a new, uh, update to this this feed, uh, and, and so we can stay on top of what things Blink is I- intending to ship, and stay on top of what features we may be able to exploit uh, in that those new functionalities. Yeah, it's super awesome. I mean, this is one of those really um, unique things that we are trying to provide to mm-hmm. the critical thinkers as you know extra value for 
um, subscribing and being part of that community. And, um, you know, so if you want to be on the front edge of all those new features that are being added into Google and the rendering engine and new event handlers and all that kind of stuff and get the XSS before anybody else does, mm. um, you know, definitely go head over to the CTBB Discord. Mm. Um, Discord.gg slash CTBB, right? Yeah, we've got that one or we've got CTBB.show slash Discord. That one yep. works too. So either of those links, they should take you right to the server. And um, yeah, we have a new channel in there, Intent to Ship. And it's monitoring for those uh, those yeah, changes, it, which is super awesome. It wasn't it wasn't like something super hard to implement. And obviously, you can just like subscribe to the you know Google group if you want. But they're gonna like bomb you with emails because it's a very active Google group. Um, so maybe you could set something up where it's like some fancy filter or something like that. That's I don't even know how you would do that, but uh, I, I've got it all coded up and and pushed into the Discord bot now. Um, so. Uh, Quick, quick win for any of you that are critical thinkers or past guest speakers that have access to that channel. Um, yeah, I'm, de I'm definitely going to keep keep an eye on it, dude. There's some really cool ones in here. Um, I didn't actually put this in the in the doc. Sorry about that, but I'll I'll put it in Discord right now. Here, go to that go to that link. Um, one of the ones that was kind of interesting was these regex modifiers that they're intending to ship that they announced um, late March that they were intending to ship. Um, where as a part of the regex, it looks like you can add uh, a flag for various things like, um, you know, the I, the M, the S flags inside the actual mm -hmm. pattern, making something like uh, case insensitive and, and that sort of thing, which I feel like mm -hmm. is pretty useful for regular expression injection. You see that? Super interesting. Yeah. And what's <laughs> what's even more interesting is it seems like there's people who are on this on this like mailing list or whatever or who are like reviewing this stuff who work at other companies. Yeah, yeah, there is. There's like some Shopify people and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't yeah, I, super I, interesting. I, I don't know. They've got this like looks good to me one, looks good to me two, looks good to me three, you know. Yeah. I I yeah, I wonder what because the group is open to anyone, so I could just respond and be like, "Looks good to me." Like some random <laughs> dude, you know, like oh, XC <laughs> XC round two. Here yeah, you. like looks great. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but definitely a cool place to to look around and read through. I know there's some some um, CSS uh, stuff that's being pushed soon regarding transitions. Um, there's some. I don't even, some of this stuff is like way, like I like like this one, declarative shadow DOM serialization. Like what's a shadow DOM? Like, I, uh, that sounds the, like that's, super. That's the secret DOM that runs all the other DOM. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> either that or something else. But um, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> there's there's definitely some, some deep browser knowledge that could be gained from reading through these and kind of understanding how this whole process flows. So I thought it'd be a cool shout out. This is always something that's fascinated me, um, you know, how, how this stuff is, like where it's defined and how it's defined. And and so, yeah, this is super cool. Um, I'm definitely going to be doing some deep dives into a bunch of these different issues and pull requests and stuff and just figuring out how this stuff works. Yeah. Alrighty, man. Um, last, last topic that I had today uh, for today was I was just going to give you sort of like a rundown of the CDN CGI research that I was talking about from before that I said that I would do and I have somewhat done in, in a, yeah, at a rare yeah, turn absolutely. of events. <laughs> okay, wow. The turnaround. I mean, this is e execution. You know, Incredible. So, all right. You know what? Before we get into that, actually, l l let's talk about that because um, I don't like that I just said, oh, just flicked that, that cup over there. I don't like that I just said that in a rare turn of events, I have followed through on the research that I would like to be doing. Um, but I feel like it's hard as a book bounty hunter and as a full-time book bounty hunter to justify spending a bunch of time researching for zero days or you know, something like that on a specific target when you do not have an application for that. Do you, do you feel that? I mean... Yeah, I mean, and we talked about this because one of the things that we wanted to look at is kind of like this... Um like one of the things we wanted to look at was a, a, a piece of software yeah. that, I mean, I'm, there are everybody, a lot of people use it. So I'm sure we'll be able to find instances of it. Yeah. But that being said, it is a huge time investment and um, energy investment into something that may or may not pan out. It doesn't have like an immediate um, impact at the moment. 
and it's also like longer scale research, but I think it's still worth it. You know, I, I think um, depending on what it is and depending on how much time you spend on it, it can be really worth it. And it can be one of those things that depending on how widely it's used, you know, I, I think we talked about this, right? Like imagine you find an XSS zero day in Google ads or Google tag manager, mm. Google analytics, mm. right? Like any of those things that are used on such a large percentage Holy of the moldy, internet, dude. right? Like you can imagine the, imp the the impacts of that would be very very broad and sweeping. So that's probably a place to spend, you know, where your time investment is going to be worth it. But if it's some really ab abstract tool that it's only used by one company, you should probably be looking at that one company's bounty table and deciding if a zero day in this piece of software is going to pay off and be worth it. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean like a zero day in in Cloudflare. I mean, w once again, it would have large reaching impact, but it, it is a one place fix as well. Like, and, and sort of the motivation for, because we talked about it at the beginning of this year, you know, wanting to do some more research this year. So I was kind of reviewing that goal and being like, all right, you know, maybe I should lean a little bit more research heavy for the next couple months. And um, yeah, it, it, like the things that have one location fix are probably not that great for us as bug bounty hunters. Like if I pop something on CDN CGI, I'm going to feel super cool and it's going to be super badass. Uh, but then I'm going to, you know, even if I report it to like everyone, yeah, then, then it's going to be like, oh, okay, you know, Cloudflare needs to fix it. Cause you can't even really put a laugh in front of a laugh, you know, <laughs> like, right. um, right. And, and so then Cloudflare is going to fix it. It's going to fix it for everyone. And I probably would just get the one bounty from, from Cloudflare, you know, cause everyone else doesn't right. really have an actionable remediation step. Um, right. and so I don't know, you know, maybe there's, there's cool research there and maybe there's, maybe there's not, but, um, I'll talk about the methodology nonetheless. So I, I wanted to see, you know, what are all the files that are available via this uh, CDN CGI endpoint? And so I did I did something scary and I went to to Google BigQuery and I queried the HTTP archive data set, man. And hopefully you used a prepaid card. <laughs> Dude, okay, so does that not freak you out? Have you ever done that before? That you can click a button and accidentally cost yourself like five hundred dollars. Not even five hundred dollars, dude. I read an article on this that was like I accidentally charged myself fourteen grand, <sighs> and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> like this is terrifying. Oh my god! But um, the response from like the Google SME or whatever was like. Dude, I'm so sorry this happened to you. You know, it was very emotionally mature response too. He was like, you know, I can't imagine what it might, must be like to, to, you know, see that number or whatever. But for you to do this, you had to be pretty dumb. Essentially, it was, yeah. and, and he's like, <laughs> for example, this is the query that would cost fourteen thousand dollars. And essentially, he's like, select star on star. You know, it's like, it's oh, like, man. like, why would you run that? And and oh. uh, it, and so. I don't know. It was a good cautionary tale for me, but I was like sweating as I pressed the run button and like <laughs> trying to figure out exactly like how to optimize all this. But at the end of the day, I queried the whole HTTP archive for every um, CDN CGI uh, URL that I could find. And I've been kind of piecing through them. There's some really interesting looking JS files there um, that are kind of small, so pretty able to be parsed and stuff like that. Um, mm. And I might drop the that whole list of of um, files into the the CTBB Discord when I'm once I'm done with the research. Just if anybody else wants to do some follow up research. Um, cool. But one of the ones that was most interesting uh, was this whole um, sur concept surrounding the the email hiding feature of of Cloudflare. And I went mm -hmm. and I found a tweet by um, Masato Kinugawa, which I think we mentioned before on the pod um, about a a XSS auditor bypass. So you remember when Chrome yeah. had like, yeah, XSS auditor? Um, they were able to use this sort of chain to bypass XSS auditor and run arbitrary, you know, uh, JS code. But but it still works. So if, if you look at this, mm. if you, uh, we'll link the, the tweet in the description, um, and Masato's website is down. But um, the, the, the payload is this, SVG, and then he does a script tag, and then he does uh, SVG, and then the data dash CFE email, and then a hex encoded string um, attribute. 
okay? And then yep. a bunch of other stuff. And then what ends up happening is the code for the email or hiding thing will go through and decode, hex decode, whatever is in that data CFE email um, attribute. It's just a CF email. Oh, yeah, right. CF email. I mean, that makes sense, Cloudflare email. Um, yeah. It'll decode whatever's in there and then just replace that whole tag with it. Uh, and, and I was like, and it uses inner HTML and everything, man. And I was like, I was poking at it for so long, trying to be like, there's gotta be like some way for me to escape this, but it, not that I can find. Um, okay. and, and so I don't think there's any like XSS or anything there, but it is a very cool way for you to use Cloudflare to obfuscate your payloads. And also, um, sort of like we learned from the, the, um, Masato Kinugawa, Teams research. Sometimes um, various HTML parsers and stuff like that will allow you to specify, uh, I think actually DOM purifies default, uh, allows you to specify data dash attributes. Um, and, and so that could allow you to smuggle some payloads through because there's some post-processing mm -hmm. that's being done with it uh, via this Cloudflare uh, script. Man, there's, there's a lot of really interesting things with like those data attributes. Mm -hmm. um, there's some other frameworks that use that type of stuff, like um, Angular. Yeah. Is it Angular? NG, like NG data yeah. and NG, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Like super, super weird, funky behavior. And I bet there's probably more of this stuff. You said that you've done some research, so I imagine that there's... Uh, I, 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 yeah. there, there is some additional stuff. I Just mostly that one that just kind of blew my mind uh, from that team's research that I mentioned a second ago of, of ng init being able to be specified as a class attribute. So mm -hmm. inside the HTML tag, class equals ng dash init colon JavaScript. And that will just yep. get run. It was like, <laughs> what? Um, so, and you know so what's funny, crazy. dude, is I, I, I like somebody had some relevant, um, you know, quip about that on Twitter. And I was like, I, I posted a picture of that screenshot <laughs> and it ratioed hard, you know, and it was like <laughs> blowing up like, oh, wow, this is, this is really interesting. I'm like, yeah, we talked about it on the pod and Masato released it months ago, you know, so <laughs> I don't know, man, it's good, but it's good to get the distribution on that. Yeah, it's super, super cool. Well, this is awesome. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to to uh to seeing that list um yeah 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 so i'm gonna i'm gonna continue doing a little bit of research on it um the the js files are really interesting unfortunately there hasn't been much that's panned out it's actually a little bit less scope than i thought it was it's just a lot of the same files so i'm condensing it down a little bit trying to find the outliers um but i would say probably optimistically i'm looking at like a csp bypass rather than a and a, you know a global Cloudflare XSS, just kind of looking at the the writing on the wall there. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, man. I think that's it. Is that a wrap? I think that's a wrap. All right, sweet. Peace. That's fun. See ya. And that's a wrap on this episode of Critical Thinking. Thanks so much for listening. And if you want more Critical Thinking content, head over to ctbb.show slash discord. Join the discord. There's lots of great conversations and chats going on over there. And if you want to support the show, there's the discord subscriber tiers, which give you access to master classes, AMAs, hackalongs, exclusive scripts, and an exclusive chat channel with us. We'll see you there.